Good evening and welcome you all for today's lecture. I'm Kamala Gunawadhan again, a council member and the chairperson of the knowledge sharing subcommittee of the Civil Engineer Sectional Committee. And I'm here to commence the lecture today. Before I start the today's program, I request you all to mute your microphones always, except when you want, if you want to ask for a question, you, you please mute them. Thank you. You all are now very much familiar about our activities of the Civil Engineer Section Committee and your participation is much appreciated. That itself an appreciation of our work as well as is a better achievement for you all. Today's webinar is a continuation of a previous lecture, Structural Forms for Tall Buildings, that's the third day, under medium price building designs and constructions by Fox Jaisinger. And this is the ninth lecture for the series. So we are starting the today's event right now, and I will call our eminent personality, who is always with the, with the comprehensive stuff of knowledge in this area. And that is how he has taken the challenge of giving you the best out of best and about these designs and constructions of this type of buildings. Without further ado, I invite Professor Jaisinger, Isan Jaisinger, Senior Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Moratur, as well as our Chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, to proceed with the lecture. Please enjoy this evening with this important webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, uh, Nini Kambala. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And also, you can see the PowerPoint presentation. Here all structures. Can you see the presentation? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes, we can, oh, you can see. see. All right. Now, last time we talked about uh, the concrete frame structures, infill frame structures, and today we talk about shear wall. And we all know when we have a lot of floors, we need lifts. The moment you lift, you can easily provide the concrete walls. And those can act as shear walls. So the name shear wall is actually not a very correct one because these walls behave as cantilevers. So basically they are they behave in cantilever mode, but we call them shear walls. So they are not behaving in shear mode, they are actually behaving in cantilever mode. So they are flexional members, but we call them shear walls. So basically, uh, shear walls are very strong because we use concrete. And concrete is a material where, uh, by increasing the strength, we can increase the elastic modulus. And in doing so, we can reduce the reflection of shear walls. So you can don't select the strength of materials just with guesswork. Always think what you want to do. And whether you have any problem with lateral deformations, whether the accelerations are too much or the deflections are too much, then you can improve the, you can increase the uh, strength of the uh, material that you use. The main material is concrete. The reinforced concrete can be made strong. So if you have small buildings, like 10 to 15 story buildings, we call them medium rise buildings, then it is correct to assume that all the lateral loads are carried by shear walls. And frame will not carry any shear, any, any lateral loads. Because of that, the frame can be designed only to carry the vertical loads. It's very easy. The moment you make this assumption, you can see the shear wall is a cantilever. Cantilever means it's fixed at the ground level, and it's behaving as a vertical member, but fixed at the ground level. Or if you make it horizontal, then you will see it's simply a cantilever. And we know cantilevers are statically determinate. So we can straight away decide the amount of uh, dead weight of the or self weight of the wall. We can also easily determine the loads uh, transferred by the slats, supported 
supporting <coughs> sorry supported by the shear walls so the steps supported by the shear walls we can easily decide how much load will be transferred onto the shear wall then we have the lateral loads the more because we assume that all the lateral loads are taken by the shear walls we can determine the bending moments why all the cantilevers are statically determined structures the moment you know the loads you can find the bending moments the moment you have the axial load and the bending moment we can design the wall how do you design the wall that is the next question and for that i will show you how we do the calculations and they are pretty straightforward calculations what we do is we treat column and the shear wall as a column so if you want to design a column subject to axial load n bending moment m so we calculate m o b h squared this way now b h we have the interaction charts like that so we have the interaction charts the moment you know the axial load when the moment we have the interaction so what we do is we have a wall which varies six meters of length maybe about 40 meters of height so we assume that though it's six meters of length it is going to behave as a column and this is the section six meters long so what we do is we assume that the 0.8 meters at the end is where we are going to provide a concentration of reinforcement and in a normal column we have lot of reinforcement here and we might need some reinforcement there then we have the links then you might have links like this we might also have links like this so something similar should be done in the wall the moment you assume it as a column so what we do is six meters let's say 0.25 meters moment is axial force will be there moment will be there and let's say the load on this is something like 10 kilonewtons per meter. If you assume that the load is 10 kilonewtons per I'll do is uh, I can control it because I'll, I'll it's easy for me. So uh, I'll control the camera. So don't worry. Uh, so basically the bending moment at the center at the bottom is w h by h by 2 so that is 40 sorry 10 into 40 into 40 by t 2 so the magnitude will be 400 multiplied by 20 8000 kilo newton meters and let's say NOBH is about 12 or 50 and MOBH squared will be 8000 into 10 to the power 6 divided by 6000 divided uh, 6000 squared by 250 so you can see 8000 is a big moment divided by 250 divided by 6000 square 0.88 so 
So if you look at a column interaction chart, you'll find that 0.88 for MO BH squared is not a big value and it's a very small value. So because of that reason, you might say, no problem. I mean, we can, uh, we can easily consider it as actually loaded member. So, So basically, uh, what we do is I'll share the screen now. Can you see these uh, charts? No. <laughs> Can you see the chart? No, no, folks, I can't. Just one moment. Can you see now? Yeah, now, now possible. Right. So basically, you can see, I'll just take uh, something. Uh, so you can see DOH ratio can be calculated, then something like 15, and we are somewhere here, 0.88. So we have to provide about a 1% rate. So let's assume that we are providing 1% reinforcement. Now you can see it can be any value, but uh, you can get it from the chart. You have to select the relevant chart. So what we do is we get 1%, six meters long, and this 0.25, and I consider 0.8 meters, 100 days of BH is equal to, uh, 1%. S is equal to 6,000 multiplied 250 divided by 100. So that is 60 to 250. 15,000 square millimeters. So what we do is we provide 7,500 at one end. And if I go with the uh, uh, 25 millimeter bars, I need, I will divide by 490 and I will get about 15 bars, 16, I will price 16. So, 2, 4, 6. And if I, if I want, I can provide one here. Or, oh, Otherwise, I can write two more. Two, four, six. Four, six. One. Uh, eight. Sixteen bars. So, 100 millimeter spacing. Then, over 8.8 meters, I get eight bars. Eight bars. 
On the other hand, you might consider concentrating some bars here. But whatever it is, it's okay because it's a six meter long wall. So this zone, whole zone will be in a high stress. Then what we do is, how are the remainder? These areas, zero per says 0 0.002, 0 0.002. But uh, we use British code, so I think the National Annexion of Sri Lanka says you have need, uh, so we might use 16 millimeter bars initially. This is a long wall, don't have a traffic transition. Then you can have 16 millimeter bars giving about 0.4%. And then close to center, you can even go up to 0.2%. Because Euro code allow you to go up to 0.2%. So towards the center, we know nothing is, can go wrong because uh, the center is not subjected to high stresses due to bending. So because of that reason, we might, we can actually uh, reduce it to 0.2. So the middle two meters, 0.2. 0.2%, then we use 0.4%, and the corners we use whatever we have calculated. And that's how we can save steel. That's how we can save steel. Uh, save steel, that's it. So here we use whatever we have calculated, that's the corner. Then we can put 0.4%, then 0.2%, and these areas we can put U bars, and in addition to that, in the more severely loaded locations, we'll make sure. These are provided some confinement, and uh, this confinement is particularly preferable to resist, to improve the earthquake resistance, because during an earthquake, these areas, cone areas will be subjected to very high stresses, and especially at the ground level and the first floor level. So because of that reason, for about three floors, we provide all these links, and after that, we can relax, we can relax. After that, we can relax. Whereas, uh, when you are coming here, you will have normal, because you don't need anything. Because if the if the reinforcement ratio is greater than 2%, you need this confinement. If it is less than 0.2%, you don't need special confinement, but what we do is we provide some mass, otherwise, these uh, cages will start will have too much sway and you'll find that it's really a problem because when you are doing construction you like something rigid so that uh, cover can be maintained easily because of that reason in sri lanka we generally don't use a diameter less than 12 millimeter in the vertical direction less than 12 millimeter in the vertical direction unless the structure is small and you want to optimize it fully and you are very much interested in reducing the cost to a bare minimum. And especially uh, the reinforcement costs can be a significant factor. Right. So that is uh, the shear walls, how to design it. And I'll uh, and go back to the north. So basically, you know how to design a shear wall now. And uh, there's one question. Okay, cannot see. It's not a question. Now, one of the important things is because we rely a lot on uh, NOBH to provide stability. The, the we, we like high high loads on the wall because if the loads are too small uh, the shear wall cannot behave as a column it might have to be, be, behave as a flexural member a beam can deliver beam which is not desirable because when when you put a lot of uh, axial load on the column the column are stable because bending moments can be easily suppressed when you have high axial so we, in the same way the shear walls also we like to have 
fairly high axial load. So make sure you have enough uh, steps supported by the shear load. That's very important. And also provide the reinforcement as for the uh, Society of Structural Engineers guide. It may be a little too stringent at some places because, uh, but by following it, you can make a reasonable detail and you cannot say you must follow this manual or that manual, but you can always follow the guidelines given in the Euro code. So always use the guidelines given in the Euro code. And earlier we used some guidelines that were given for British code, given for British code in, in a standard textbook. Use it. And uh, now we are moving for Euro codes. So when you are moving for the Euro, Euro code, Sri Lanka songs properly. Sri Lanka is not subjected to very high earthquakes. And is India this India is Sri Lanka and some people are talking about some formation of some boundary here but this is pure nonsense because this in geological scale You know, plates cannot be formed in our scale. Your scale is something like one million years. So it's all pure nonsense. So don't think we'll have earthquakes. We'll not have earthquakes. Sri Lanka is a country that will not have earthquakes. But nothing can be. 100% safe, 99% safe, 1% not safe. We are structural engineers. We can't take even that 1% risk. So we do, what we do is, we go for weak beam, strong column, so that all these hinges will form here. All the hinges will form here. So, because hinges will form here, what we need is a special detail for the beams for about 0.6 meters to 0.9 meters. Is a small beam 0.6 meters if it's a, a large beam for about 0.9 meters, you provide, my practice is, I provide 8 millimeter diameter uh, high uh, QT bars at 75 millimeter, 70 centimeter. Few links, after that you relax and you can provide the normal shearings. The reason is, if you draw the stress strain curve for, or sorry, moment curvature curve for reinforced concrete, if you have a normal section, face like this, you have some kind of confinement, it goes, a lot of confinement, it goes like that. That means when you have a lot of confinement, you get a fairly ductile type of behavior. So the reason is if you by providing a lot of reinforcement, we can create triaxial state, but the catch is you can't get it, you can't get the triaxial state by using my steel. Always make sure the beam links are QT bars, and if you want to save money, go for eight millimeter QT bars. Go for eight millimeter QT bars, it's fine, no problem. You get good ductility because if you use six millimeter my steel, my steel is as a strength of only 250 newtons per millimeter squared or megapascal. 
or megapascal. So because of that reason, my seed can easily eat. And that cannot provide confinement, what we call triaxial is seed. Axia, it cats here, it axis here. So in all directions, you are confining it. The moment you do that, concrete will become super strong, super strong. And how will you do that? We put parallel links in the plastic hinge zone so that plastic hinges will always occur in beams and beams, beam concrete will never crack. Will never crack. But the good thing about Sri Lanka is the maximum magnitude that we can expect is only about six. And because of that reason, because of that reason, six on richer scale, and because of that reason, the chances of an earthquake lasting more than 20 seconds is very low. But there is another case in one country. This is north, this is south. South of what? America. And there's a fall going right round from top to bottom. This is California, you get earthquakes. This is Peru, all the South African, South American countries you get earthquakes. So the problem is in 1906, there was a great earthquake near San Francisco earthquake. So after this earthquake, the city fathers appointed a committee and the committee gave a very damaging report. They said, we have built a city at the wrong place. Because we have built a city on a huge fault and this fault will, can become active one day or the other. And after 1906 earthquake, there was a huge Fire and then completely destroyed, almost completely destroyed. San Francisco. More than 70% of the city was cutted by the fire. So, what did they do? This America. They decided we are not going to respect the professionals. We are going to rebuild the city because it was a great city before the earthquake. So we are going to have the same great city after that. Then they constructed. So San Francisco was the biggest city on the western coast. It remained like that. On the eastern coast, you have New York. Somewhere in the middle of the country, you get you get Chicago. So three huge three cities competing each other for with huge buildings. And then in 1990, 1991, yes, 1991, then there's another huge earthquake. Another huge earthquake. In California, it's called North Bridge Earth. And all the people thought, this, okay, it's fine. All our structures have survived. It's huge earthquake. But still they thought, okay, let's, let's investigate. So you have, you have I section, I section. So, so you get plates welded, then there are beams. They found all their buildings okay, but what happened here? Severe damage, severe damage to the earthquake, to the beams, which are properly connected to the columns. 
and they found huge repair bills. They had repaired the buildings. Now, because of that thing, so these I heard uh, what they do is they go for a joint where they deliberately introduce a weak section here. Deliberately introduce a weak section here. Because this shear ejection has to carry only the shear force. <coughs> they will not carry any moment because they are still the support. Are still connected. But the moment you have a weak connection, what will happen? In an earthquake, these places will form plastic hinges. Because plastic hinges form only at one section, all the sections stronger than that will remain elastic. So we can we will create a control plastic hinge, not just arbitrary plastic the control plastic key at a location that we want and that will assure that the hinges will always form at the weaker section and the remaining sections will remain elastic primarily under service condition. So they have introduced this particular joint and if you want to know more about this please uh, contact Dr. Kushan Vijay Sundara of Para Engineering uh, Department of Civil Engineering, Engineering Faculty. He's one of the best to talk about earthquakes and earthquake detailing. Or else contact Dr. Pradeep of Auburn University. He also can talk a lot about earthquakes and earthquake detailing. And otherwise, uh, you can contact Professor Sujiva Levan Gamagi of Department of Civil Engineering. Again, he's a real master of the game. So we have three very bright people and uh, Dr. Pradeep is the student of Dr. Sujiva. When he was, Dr. Sujiva used to teach at uh, University of Rural Engineering Faculty in 2007-8, he was there and uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, did his final year project under the supervision of Dr. Professor Sujiva Leongamage. And then he went to, uh, went to one of the European countries. Uh, I can't remember whether it's Italy or not Italy. He went to one of the uh, one of the European countries. I can't remember what country exactly. Uh, not England, but one of the European countries. Uh, not Italy either. Italy was uh, Doctor. Uh, Kushan Vijayasundra was in Italy, but uh, Dr. Pradeep was in one of those countries. And he learned a lot. He's very good with designs. So because of that reason, I have invited him to come for, uh, to deliver some lectures, especially on composite systems, composite systems. So you can see there are so many different details these structures always keep in mind you can't do normal structures and expect earthquake resistance to get earthquake resistance you have special type of uh, structures and i'll make it a point uh, engineer kamala we can actually get a guest lecture by dr kushan vijay sundara on yes. these earthquake special earthquake details for uh, steel structures <coughs> Can you make a note of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. And also Dr. Pradeep agreed to talk on uh, dynamics, structural dynamics. He's very good in structural dynamics. And also he, he agreed to talk on composite subsystems. Composite subsystems. Oh, professor, I had a chat with uh, Professor Dr. Laksiri. So he, he will, we have to give a date for him. That's all. Who, but who, who, Dr. Early March, we can do it. Uh, oh, Dr. Laksin for Pradeep. Sorry? Yes. Dr. Pradeep, Laksin Pradeep. Uh, he says Pradeep. I, I call him Pradeep. He's Sandarige Pradeep. He has, he has a name for Laksin also. Right. Okay. Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So please give him a chance. Yeah, right? yeah. So he can do it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Then, uh, 
that is the about three structures concrete structures we my practice is i put more shillings to provide confinement and those things will be high steel bars so yes and in addition to that if you look at our type of detailing where we confine a lot of steel at the ends you can you can give lot of ductility to the shear wall so even if you use any other method make sure you have sufficient concentration of vertical reinforcement and the confined reinforcement in the special in the lower floors of a shear wall and that that type of shear walls will have huge ductility so even after so many cycles you will still find that the shear wall is willing to take more loads in technology right so then we look look at shear wall structures there are so many different types and when you understand it is very easy for you to visualize how the structure is going to be now here you can see in these shear walls the length does not change the thickness changes by the same amount then the system is statically determined because the longer wall the longer wall will not this one will not transfer any low, any extra loads to this one so but if you look at the deflection deflection is given by delta is given by wind load l to the power 4 divided by e i multiplied by k k is a factor because it's not one it can be 5 or 384 something it can be 1048 or 1080 or something 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 w l to the power 4 why l to the power 4 because w is a udl and because of that w l to the power 4 otherwise you can get units in meters right then it says divided by e i so when i is higher deflection is lower delta is equal to w l to the power 4 divided by e i multiplied by k that means higher the i value longer the wall thicker the wall lower the deflection and the moment one member decides i'm going to I am going to control the reflection due to the presence of a rigid diaphragm at each floor level. All the other walls will have to behave as the big one says. And big one says, I am going to control the reflection and he will control the reflection. So, but if you look at the situation here, one wall does not transfer any other, any load to the other wall through the through the slab so because of that reason we call it proportionate uh, walls proportionate walls and also we say the load on the wall is a function of the i value longer the wall it carries higher load shorter the wall it carries less And then you can see, I'll keep it for a moment so that you can go through it. When you are going through it later, still we can, you can go through it. So the shear walls are very strong. They can carry externally induced moments and axial loads. And you can arrange the shear walls symmetrically so that no twisting will occur. No twisting will occur in the in the, in the structure. No twisting will occur in the structure. Then what can you say about the loads acting on each wall? 
loads acting in, on each wall will depend on the stiffness. So you find E i divided by sigma e i. So if, if one wall is strong and it, it represents 70% of the 70% of the stiffness, then 70% of the load will be carried by that wall. Whereas the other wall will carry only 30%. And the deflection of the structure will be decided by the stronger ball. But what will happen? If you do not arrange the shear wall symmetrically, the moment you do not arrange the shear wall symmetrically, the structure will move in the direction of wind. But because you are applying a load at the center of the building, but resisting at a different location, what will happen to the structure? Structure will twist. Structure will twist. Because you can see the shear center, center of wall rigidity, so shear center is at one place and the load is acting at a different place. The moment that happens, they can be a torsional moment acting on the building, which is not desirable. So when we are doing designs, we do try our best to avoid this stretching, but if you can't avoid uh, the walls are proportionate, then you can easily find the moment acting on each wall. Now for that, you can, you have to find the location of the twist and then You can use this equation. You can use this equation and find the the the, the loads acting on each wall, and then when the moment you know the loads, you know the shear force and the bending moment. You know the shear force and the bending moment, right? And then you can even have more complicated situation when. The shear walls are arranged in all directions. Before the computers were there, people did all these manual calculations. But we are very lucky. We have computers and good software like MIDAS or ETAPS or SAP2000. They are all good software. You can easily find the bending moment or the stresses on the shear walls. So no need to use any of these long equations, but I wanted to show you what happens. So when the twisting occurs, the twisting can be resisted not only by the walls in its own direction, but it can be it can be that the walls are in the perpendicular direction. But fortunately, when you do all these things, when you put walls not symmetrical, structure can twist, all kinds of problems. The good thing is, a computer model can be built. And then you have non proportionate structures which are statically not determinate, especially at the places where here you can see this wall is reducing the length, this wall is not reducing the length. So at these locations, you find there can be significant amount of redistribution of numbers. So because of that reason, uh, if you want, you can uh, use them, but always keep in mind the floor, floor levels where the shear wall arrangements are changing, you have to carefully deal with those things. Then, now we can see there's a symmetrical structure here, not going to twist, going to move only, and you like to see how it behaves. One option is create a three-dimensional model. The other option is the other option is convert it to a two-dimensional mathematical model. So your two-dimensional structure is not the actual structure, it's only a mathematical model. Anyway, keep in mind, the moment you start, you start 
uh, utilizing finite element based software you are always doing approximate analysis and because it's approximate analysis so what we create is not the structure it is a mathematical model of the real structure never ever say somebody these these the architectural form and this is my mathematical model and say the structure and mathematical models are the same no need no. here this is a good example we have a three dimensional structure but the mathematical model is two so i'll move to the next one now when you have a shear walls aligned we can go for something called coupled shear walls there's a huge advantage of copper shear walls. A later day, I'll show you with some calculations how to uh, find the stresses in copper shear walls. Then you can have a combination of shear walls and frames. And when you have a combination of shear walls and frames, what happens is the walls will not behave on the pure cantilever mode. Initially, at the bottom floors, it will be a cantilever, then the shear activity. Then the, then the shear transfer will uh, dominate and at the top part of the building we say it's a shear mode shear mode and shear mode as the structure will come back uh, from the cantilever mode and i think i explained it i can't remember so basically uh, this is a flexural or cantilever mode this is a flex this is a shear mode in shear mode, you get the maximum rotation at the bottom, whereas in the cantilever mode, it's fixed at the bottom. Then when you combine, you get a behavior like this. Very straightforward. And you will ask, what are these rings? These rings are the four diaphragms connecting the system. So the four diaphragm is connecting the shear walls to the floor. So rigid diaphragm. So these uh, members actually represent the rigid diaphragm. So what are the advantages of wall frame interruption? First one is lateral deformation is significantly reduced to about 40%. And bending in walls and wall assemblies will be less stringent because coupling action can uh, transfer additional moments in the reverse direction and you know, resist, help to resist. Right, so you get uh, the main advantage of wall frame interaction is because we have shear walls, columns can still be designed as brace columns. Columns can still be designed as brace columns. No need to consider that columns, the frame is stronger and shear wall is weaker because that reason the shear wall can move uh, more than the frame so shear wall is uh, not as strong as the frame or vice versa but because shear walls are there they can resist excessive deformations is suggested 
columns can be designed as braced columns and giving a huge advantage because the it says transfers for buffering is low. So this is a button, this is a cube, and there's a there's a famous engineer called Khan, and he invented. So this is basically North India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So we had good connection between these two. From our Trinh Phuc Harbour. We sent. We used to, uh, sorry, the people used to associate the people of North India. So the Prince Vijaya came from this area, and he brought their language for Bengali. So our language is a mix of Bengali and the original language we had here. So we have a huge language, which is much broader than Bengali. So they say in Bengali, about fifty percent of the language is uh, for fifty percent of the language is from Sanskrit. But in our language, we have so many words because of that. We have only about. Twenty-five to thirty percent of the language as Sanskrit, and we all talk the same language. So, in 1923, one engineer was born, and then he moved to USA as a Fulbright Scholar. He never came back, but he created history for coming up with so many different, very successful. Structural forms, which are all behave, all based on the behavior of them. All based on the behavior of them. All based on the behavior of them. And his name is Hutz Khan. Hutz Khan, and he's a very brilliant structural engineer, and he came up with all these uh, ideas like. The perforated tube. So it's called hull structures. And one of the biggest problems is you have to carry, carry all the loads to the bottom, then you find columns. Because to enter the building without any hindrance, you need large openings at the ground level. To, to allow large openings at the ground level, what you do? Then, when people wanted stiffer buildings, they provided a core and an outer periphery. One of the problems with this outer periphery is it can be subjected to shear lag. Shear lag means plane sections do not remain plane. One of the key assumptions of building theory is plane sections remain plane, but in This type of structures, due to flexibility, plane sections will remember not remain plane. And when that happens, we call shear lag effect. Shear and shear lag of effect occurs. Then you will find the highest loads are carried only at the corners, whereas when it comes to the middle of the structure, very little load is carried because of shear lag.
then comes the bundle tube concept bundle tube so it's like he got this idea from um, bamboos looking at bamboos and he actually died at a low young age of 53 and he came up with this bamboo and this bamboo is used in sears tower and you can type sears tower usa then it will say it's an outdated name they change the ownership so it becomes another name then 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 those guys again sold the property now it's a completely different name so the advantage of bundle tube is to understand that just consider the bundle of bamboo with one bamboo one bamboo is good but when it becomes slender it needs support the support can be given by putting all the tubes together not either four tubes or nine tubes you put them together and then make the structure super strong even even though we consider it super strong even with this type of all the measures still CS tower can behave in a uh, with excessive deflections in a, on windy days. Then people found that possible to connect the middle part and the outer by using huge beams and the depth of the beam can be as large as three meters huge beam in that there's a there's an outer uh, there's a, yes this there's an uh, there's something closer to outrigger and uh, that, that is two floors that means six meters high Sometimes you find even the deep beams connecting the facade and the the facade and the uh, spore to make it more effective. You put a cross in the other direction. So in, the moment you put a truss in the other direction, what will happen? The truss will ensure that all the pulleys are loaded to a reasonable degree. So the structure will have even more, even desirable uh, behavior. Uh, this is not a very good type of structure. It's only like, you know, floors are hanging from above which I don't like very much. And then you can get hybrid structures where you have outriggers, you have cores, you have uh, the bundle tubes, tubes, everything. So uses of fan and legs. And this is the same story here. Just You can get very complicated structures these days. Architects come, come up with utterly complicated structures. And then the solution comes with diagonal frames. With diagonal frames. And they are called diagrids. So what you see in Alta is a diagrid. The, the inclined tower, what you see is a diagrid. It's a diagonal grid. And using diagrids, you can create very complicated stuff. Then I briefly touch on flows. There's a huge problem with flows. Because you say there's a beam.
in a slab, the depth of the neutral axis will be about 0.1 B. And here, 0.1 B. What happens to the remaining part of concrete? What happens to the remaining part of concrete? We can see that fact. So it's fact. And to control the crack quits, we provide minimum reinforcement. And then the crack here. But these crack concrete also would have a weight because they all have weight. What will happen? What happens is you add a lot of self, lot of weight as self weight. So if you want to optimize, get rid of all this extra concrete. The moment you get rid of concrete, the steel needed to control cracking can go down drastically. So here we get rid of all these different things. And how do you get rid of all these things? You can pick fast two beams. Have a thin slab. Have a thin slab. And make sure there are links another 50 millimeter of that thing. And these pairs. Just one moment. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have done a blunder. So basically, when you have a slab, there are beams, slab, yes. but only the depth of the neutral axis will be about 0.1 D or 0.15 D. All the concrete, remaining concrete is cracked and cracked concrete, in, concrete will add to the weight of the structure, the weight of the structure without doing much, but to control the crack fits, we are for it. Minimum reinforcement. So minimum reinforcement. We have extra concrete. These days, one meter cube of concrete is 22,000 rupees. One ton of steel is can go up to about 370,000 rupees. And is it worth putting all these additional feet and concrete? Answer is no. So we can think of simply beam slab systems where beams and slabs, uh, bottom slabs can be precast and precast to be sufficiently lightweight. And what we do after that is we'll put them together with some reinforcement, connect, them, connect everything and make a beam set system. And the same thing with steel, use of steel for composite construction where this thickness can be secure. Dr. Pradeep is an expert on this. He designs these type of structures often and bring about huge savings to the clients. So we'll ask him to explain the, the design aspects of composite subsystems as well, because that is going to be the future. Because we are, concrete is very expensive, steel is very expensive. If something is very expensive, find the cheaper option.
So there are so many different subsystems. And then we can also have resistance concrete. Such as these precious concrete subsystems are very popular, very popular where, in countries where the labor cost is very high. And they use it to minimize the effort at the site. And I would say these also can minimize the effort at the site. Whereas the domus have huge amount of work at the site. So the future is going for new systems, thinking outside the box and developing PT-based new systems and so on. So instead of using reinforced concrete for this lab, you can try PT. So these are precast lab. The moment you use PT, you'll find that the sections can be made thin. The sections can be made thin. So you can see there are so many different aspects, different systems that we can use to resist lateral loads. And one of the key parameters for this lateral load resistance is the horizontal rigidity offered by the slabs. We call them rigid diaphragms. Rigid diaphragms. And because we are using concrete, we can always claim that we are rigid and we are having rigid diaphragms. Whatever the systems I have shown here, you use it, no problem. But if you want to use this system, it's very expensive. When you have a 34 story building, you can see easy to save 20, 25 percent. So always think. We have PT, precious concrete, we have red concrete. And out because we have precast construction methods, and out of these, the weakest or the worst is normal B flat construction. It's very expensive. So it will be much cheaper to go for these systems because you need only very little steel. We need only very little steel here. Just to keep the height, because if you look at this slab, 300 millimeters, we have 50 millimeter thickness, and you'll have a 10 millimeter bar. These are six millimeters, these are 10 millimeter bars. So the 10 millimeter bar will carry, ensure oh no failure. And we use six millimeter bars at the corners or eight millimeter bars at the corners, knowing where we are, we are going to get another eight millimeter bar. And what we do is when you're casting, we cast with a shape like this. And we'll have a key. So when you go concrete, you'll have proper connection. So with that, I can say that you know most of the structural form related things have been discussed. And in chat channel, we have uh, uh, advanced final, uh, yes. Some says, you know, let's see how to use finite element software. I'm going to do it, but my theory is finite element is a mathematical model. Before doing any mathematical model, understand the behavior so that you, you can predict the answers before you do the finite element. And then you will say, I'm doing finite element because, 
I like to have a big report, big design report. Otherwise, I have enough knowledge to do manual calculations. And, you know, so don't think minor element is a big deal. It's nothing. Don't consider it as any important. It's not important. Once you know the theory, finite element becomes nothing. But on the other hand, use finite element without knowing the theory. Is without knowing the, how to how to do modeling, then whatever the moment you come across something new, you're on quicksand. You don't know what to do. Then you start struggling. But if you do the theory part first, then it's very easy. What is the allowable deviation now in setting out? Zero. 20 story building. No, you don't have allowance. Get it right. There's no way you can have errors in buildings. So, if some, never allow anything to go wrong, make it as perfect as possible. So, better to have interactive platform for advanced finite element. Yes, we will have. We'll have. We certainly teach you, but there are so many very good finite element modelers in this country. And if you are in a hurry, just talk to one of them. And also go through internet. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called uh, Advanced Computer Modeling of uh, Structures, I think. But you don't have to do anything. Just go to YouTube and type my name, MTR Jaisinga. You can uh, you can download many many YouTube videos where the finite element modeling is taught and do learn it yourself. Uh, Shear wall, the minimum percentage of steel in the vertical direction is 0.2%. Horizontally 0.1%. That is the Euro code. But I don't like it. I like, as I said, I like concentration reinforcement, then 0.4% vertically, then 0.2%. Euro code, the horizontal requirement is 0.25. So I might stay a little lower because uh, Euro code allows 0 0.02%. And if the lateral load taken by the shear wall is less than a certain limit, there's no nothing for nothing like that. If you have a shear wall, always it's uh, it's it's always its second motor area will be much larger than the first. So because of that reason. The deflection will be totally controlled by the shear wall. So the wall frame is restrained from movements. So there's absolutely no chance for columns to buckle unless you have designed so thin uh, very small uh, uh, columns. We don't do it. So in high rise building, the columns can never. So will precast concrete slab provide adequate diaphragm? Yes, because we are having about 60 millimeter thick concrete, and there will be so many additional steels going here and there with six millimeter bars. So that type of uh, very light to extreme. So because of all these things. The moment you use uh, composite slabs or precast slabs, the system that I, I am I am introducing, absolutely no way, no problem. The buildings can last. Well, because diaphragm action will be active all the time. Uh, slabs I don't analyze. I'll just, uh, how do you analyze slabs? I don't analyze. Because uh, BS uh, 
8110 gives a very good table. So just use that table and design the same. I mean, even when you are doing the design for Europe, or still you can uh, design the SAP for British uh, uh, code. Why? SAP is the simplest possible, simplest possible element that you can ever, ever, ever use. So because of that reason, we optimize class. And so once you analyze the slabs to build slab systems, then you don't have to, uh, you can just uh, do your manual calculations. So that is, that's all the questions. So don't have any fear. Sir? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, so when we are, uh, um, when we are constructing a pre-cast or pre-stressed uh, for the slab, uh, pre-stress concrete for the slab, uh, that means uh, the slab be, uh, slab won't be a, a single unit, no, sir. It, it has several parts, no, sir. So in yeah, that no, case... No, these uh, are two, yeah, just, just see, just see. Okay. We don't pass it like this. We do something special. Yes, And we put reinforcement to correct it. Even uh, six minute wire is enough. The moment you connect all these things, they become so rigid because there will be a bond between all these. And even when you are fixing here, you will put drought. So all these will become one unit. And even you, if any unit starts to disintegrate, no, no problem because all these are now acting together. You can see, we will have additional things. We are not going to rely on the board. We we'll never ever rely on the board. What's the answer? So if you have anything like 60 millimeter or more speed, it can hold everything together. Sir, uh, if, if you are using sir, precast uh, units, sir, uh, do we require to do this um, uh, uh, discontinuous, uh, discon uh, con uh, that mean? Uh, slab coefficient we have to uh, consider as a discontinuous so we can consider uh, continuous no 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 these uh, when you are using all these precast systems they are one way they are one way slabs you have two beams we put something and they, you can consider them as one way slabs but if you want you can design it in such a way that it will give a continuity it will give a continuity so basically, Thank you, sir. you have the beam, you have the slab, you have this. I want to review this. So you make it continuous. So in the slab viewpoint, straight train for them. So that in the in situ section, in situ part, in situ cast part. There will be enough reinforcement strategically placed so that all these beams will not be individual. They are all linked. These beams are, although they look independent, they will become dependent because we put this type of things and put cottage scheme here and there, but don't overdo it, but just to put something. So the moment you do completing, everything will be there. They will all become one unit. Have I answered all the questions? Mm -hmm. And you can download on the internet about all these different precast systems. And just go through those papers. And last time also I would have told you. MTR does a DEF. You can get useful papers. So keep in mind knowledge is wealth. Skills may not be wealth. So, for example, if you are capable of designing and repeating the same slab, same type of beams over and over again. Excuse me, sir. 
uh, you will have the you will have the skill but the knowledge not the knowledge knowledge is you know reading knowledge is gained by reading so you have to do your own reading for that it is very easy internet is there you can download so many things on internet and you can do self learning to improve yourself so when you have this kind of support on one side you have real teaching on the other side you have your own knowledge gathering so after about four five years you will become a superb engineer who can always look at problems in a logical manner are you wanted to ask an as a question excuse me sir yeah hello sir yeah sir the, are there any national annexes so that uh, manuals uh, to follow against that uh, earthquake load design for earthquake load no. you can use whatever the british uh, whatever, whatever the things that british have done and uh, so basically you use if you are using euro code you want to do anything whenever you don't see a national annex just just use the uk national annex So, India Kamala, what shall we do? Yeah. yeah, actually now it's eight, almost eight thirty. So there are several questions. So shall we take those questions in the first <coughs> few minutes in the next lecture? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I can take about one or two questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you are okay, I can. Uh, shall I read it? Yeah, yeah, okay, read? okay, okay, no problem. <coughs> What is the allowable deviation in setting out in, say, twenty-story building? Uh, I mean, I I answered it. I said, you know, don't talk about allowances. There's no allowance. You must get it right. If, if something goes wrong, we can see whether whether it's within the allowance. But but any allowance is detrimental. Don't talk about allowances in all rooms. So I have still answered the questions in the chat box, unless you have new ones. Yeah, in the same question, is asking how are we dealing with this issue at design stage? No design stage, no allowance, nothing. You just do it. But when you are designing a shear wall, always you consider the the vertical loads will act at uh, at an eccentricity of going up to twenty degrees. Yeah. Okay. What is the minimum percentage of steel for a shear wall? I I I answered that point to you. I told. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it would be better to have. I think uh, this one you address, but not as a question. Yeah. It would be better to have an interactive platform for advanced finite elements. Yeah, I told that you know you can they can they can actually go to the internet uh, internet and get down uh, uh, download this. Uh, Uh, videos and they can learn a lot. Those videos are very good and they cover the detail, the the modeling part. What is the minimum percentage of steel for a shear wall? The same question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, same question. I, I asked. Yeah, what What is the allowable deviation in setting out in a twenty-story building? How are yeah, we? That also we answer. Yes. Same answer. Yeah. I couldn't read. If the yeah, taken yeah. by the shear wall is less than certain limit, does the columns need? No, there is there is nothing limit. There is no limit because I can't understand how that person gets that question. The, somebody would have given completely wrong information. <laughs> you cannot have percentages. Uh, I think uh, we'll. It's eight thirty, professor. So I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. We will wind up. Yeah. It's like same. Uh, okay, shall we wind up? Oh. Yes, we'll wind up. We'll wind up. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, well, sir, yeah, it's a big thank to you. I will call engineer yeah. Patma Renuka Kamagi to deliver her vote of thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, good evening to everyone. It is uh, such an honor for me to get this opportunity 
to thank you all on behalf of civil engineering sectional committee today's lecture uh, was a uh, structural form of tall buildings and continuation from last week i take this opportunity to thank you uh, our uh, express thank i take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to you professor Sisan Jai Singh, for your sharing valuable experience, knowledge, and opinion. Dear sir, we got we gathered from lot from your lecture, and we refreshed our knowledge too. Thank you very much, sir, for spending your valuable time with us. even with your busy schedule secondly my special thank goes to uh, engineer kamala gunawardena member of uh, civil engineering sectional committee and chairperson of knowledge sharing sub committee uh, forgetting webinar arrangement i also thanks engineer manjula uh, secretary of uh, civil engineering sectional committee uh, and the committee member of knowledge sharing sub committee for your support i must uh, mention uh, my deep sense of appreciation isl secretariat especially uh, uh, mr chamila mr Chamara and Ms. Gayatri uh, for supporting and hosting and other arrangements. Dear participants, thank you very much for your active participation. Uh, without you, we can't get this event success. And hope you will continue to join uh, this lecture series on every Tuesdays. thank you very much professor you are a uh, very good presentation a very uh, detailed presentation thank you very much professor and thank you very much sir. thank you welcome sir uh, have a wonderful uh, evening to you all thank you very much good night sir good night all thank, thank you, you. Thank you.